Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of my Sunderland 11. As always, you're in association with the Sunderland Food Bank and where is it? There we go. The Sunderland Fans Museum as well. Go check them out. Links are in the description below. Today's guest, a uh, very special guest, another ex Sunderland player. He needs no introduction. You can see him already. It's Marcus Stewart. Marcus, how are you? Hi, I'm fine. Thank you. Yeah, all good. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Um, well, what are you up to these days and how, how's your lockdown going? Uh, I'm quite enjoying it, actually. I um, <laughs> I took a bit of a break from my role as assistant manager at Warsaw uh, last last April, would have been. It's almost a year now uh, for family reasons. And, you know, being a coach for such a long time, being in football for a long time as well, uh, it does weigh you down sometimes. And sometimes you have to take take stock, rethink things. I thought that was a perfect time to do it. And the honest truth, I've not regretted any, any little bit of it, if I'm honest. I've, um, I've quite enjoyed my time in lockdown. Um, I know there's a lot of people that wouldn't have done, but I, I have. Uh, and luckily, you know, we're coming out the end of it now, um, hopefully in the next few months. And um, I'm ready to get back involved and get back doing things because, you know, it's been tough for everyone, and I think it's just starting to take its toll a bit now on, on, on most people, uh, including myself, a little bit. Yeah, do you think it's also made you realize how important football is to a lot of people's lives, you know, especially when it's just taken away from so many people so easily? Yes, it does. I mean, you know, we've not been able to see family members, members, a lot of lot, well, everyone in the country, really. So, I think those sorts of things that you took for granted originally, um, you know, will be new uh, and it'd be exciting for everyone to get back and do those sorts of things go to the pub go to the gym play football watch football There's so many things to look forward to now um so yeah it's it's just going back to normality that people haven't had in, in the past year and almost this has become normality and i think a lot of people have got used to it so i think it will take a lot of getting used to again just to get back to normal yeah, I think it's it's something that a lot of people are looking forward to. Though you know, you know, so the the days are getting warmer now. You know, something's doing. A, you know, they're on a good run run of form now, and um, you know, every day is a step closer to um, you know, a bit of freedom and the restrictions being lifted. So yeah, that's all good. Marcus, I want to take you sort of right back to sort of you growing up and what are your memories of of, of football? Uh, I remember remember playing loads and loads of street football. Um, the area I was brought in up in was a council estate. Um, my earliest memories were when I was, I uh, must have been between seven and 11, you know, maybe in six. Um, every Sunday, all the kids used to get together on, on the local bit of green you could find that was, you know, big enough to play a football game on. And however many turned up, um, the older guys used to split us into, you know, 6v6, 10v10, however many guys turned up, it was generally boys that turned up and played. Um, and off the back of that, we played the first of 20, and if it was over within 10 minutes, we'd go again. If that game lasted a bit longer, we'd, 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 we'd probably finish it and, and go off our own ways, but that's what I remember, really, playing with older lads, lads my age, um, whoever turned up really got a game, uh, and eventually got from playing different streets and different areas where I was from. The weird thing is, I don't know how they organised it, it was just it was no Facebook back then and no mobile phones. It was just a case of turn up and whoever turned up had a game. And it was generally the same time every afternoon, two o'clock, three o'clock-ish, whatever it was. Whoever was walking around the corner would join in. You think, well, let's hope someone else turns up and someone else will walk around the corner. And then off the back of it, you had a game of football. Um, and that's my earliest memories, really. And those were pretty good days. And I often go back and drive past that green that I started on um, over in Bristol and, uh, kind of drive on the road and reflect a bit. It's quite nice. Yeah, the, the, those were better days. It's before the days of sort of, you know, sitting at home playing uh, FIFA. You know, it's better to actually be out um, sort of in a, in a field and having a, a kick around with, with your friends. And I think it's a it's a thing not a lot of people do anymore, to be honest. And and it's a, and it's a thing I'm sure a lot of people miss. Yeah, they do. I mean, football these days is much more structured and organised, isn't it? You know, there's a range of training sessions. You very rarely see kids playing on the green unless they're with their dads or they might go into the park where there's a man-made football pitch, you know, a concrete one these days, but very rarely on the green. There might be one or two kids that if, if the, the local clubs were um, 
kind enough to leave football nets up uh, that might go around to those clubs and play on the, the, the pitches that are unused at the time. But very rarely do you see actual street football going on um, because I said there's so much stuff going on. They can, they can go training with a local club on a Tuesday night, on a Thursday night, whatever night they do it. Um, or they can go to the local park and play on a concrete pitch, which are, you know, with a basketball net involved as well. Um, so th- there was none of that sort of stuff around then. It was all trying to make jumpers for goalposts back then. So yeah. That's how it was. Yeah, it, exactly. Yeah, the, the, those were better days, I, I'm sure. But obviously, as you said, you know, growing up in, in Bristol, was there sort of uh, obviously two main teams in Bristol, Bristol Rovers and Bristol City? Was there a team you were more uh, lean, leaning towards? I was a Bristol City fan back then, yeah. Oh, that's the side of town I was brought up on, uh, the south, south side of Bristol. Um, north side was generally Bristol Rovers. And, yeah, and that's how it was. You know, I was two miles from the ground uh, and grew up supporting them. So in terms of big teams, you know, you know, in, in Division 1 it would have been then. Um, there wasn't really one, anyone really. It was just local football and then, I never really got a chance to support a big team, never went to watch a big game. When I was young, I just got straight into football when I was 13, 14, playing for boys' clubs and uh, local teams. And then it went from there, really. So football from 12, 13 years old kind of took up the rest of my life. Yeah, exactly. So you never really got the chance to attend football games as, as a fan, really, and, and, well, and be part be part of that. Do you think that's something you've wished you, you've sort of been able to do or, or, or you, you're pleased of how you've experienced football so far? Um, it's a good question um, because that's part of the reason why I wanted this little break to be able to go and do stuff like that with, with, with mm. friends or our team for ages, but we haven't been able to. So I hope in the next six months to a year I get a chance to go and watch it as a fan because, like I said, I missed out on that because I was the other side of the fence by playing the game and people watching me. So um, there's no plans as yet, but me and friends I've talked about going to watch uh, teams play, um, local teams especially, and that will happen in the next, you know, this season to finish, hopefully um, normal, normalish time, end of April, May, uh, and hopefully next season will start normalish time, you know, August time. So next August, September, October, whatever day it is, I hope hopefully I'll go and watch the game as a fan. I have been going to watch teams, don't get me wrong, but obviously I'm scouting normally or I'm watching players or watching teams. So it's nice just to switch my brain up and watch the games as a fan normally. Yeah, I can speak for a lot a lot of Sunderland fans when we say all we ever want to do is just be back in the Stadium of Light again and uh, going to away games. It's, you know, it's something a lot of people just live for, really. And they, they spend sort of their... You know, I mean, you know, going going back in, into history now, um, you know, back in Sunderland, people would work all week in sort of the, you know, the, the pits and the shipyards just to save up to go watch the match on, on a Saturday. And um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's just that because a lot of people's lives revolve around going to watch football. They do. They do. And uh, that's what everyone misses. You know, you can watch the games on TV and listen to the crowd, um, whichever setting you've got it on, whether it's whatever you've got it on setting wise. Um, and it's not the same, you know, not seeing the crowds there. So, you know, this, this, you know, as a player, I remember the smell of the football ground when you're on the middle of the pitch. Back in the day, there was a smell of pies going around. There was a smell of cigars. There was the smell of a, an aroma of a football ground when you're in the middle of the pitch. is quite unique. And I'm sure, you know, those the atmosphere goes with it as well. It's not just watching the game. It's getting meeting friends that you haven't seen for ages, sitting in the same seat that you've sat in for 20 years next to someone else who sat there for 20 years and had the season ticket. So it's about the the, the um, social side of it as well, not just going to watch the football, the, you know, the, the, the beers before, the beers after, whatever you're going to do after. And that's what it's all about. Is it goes hand in hand. It's a day out. Yeah, that's what that's what people make it. It's not, it's just not going to the game and turn up for kickoff. A lot of people go and make a day of it. Um, so no, I think that like I say, people have missed it because before you know, take it for granted. You know, every, every other week you go and watch your team um, at home. Might go to away games, of course, if you're a Harden fan. But generally, it was every other week, and you turn up and go and watch a game. But now it's been taken away. People people are starting to realise how much how much sport in general, not just football, um, sport with crowds, how much they're missing it. Yeah, yeah, it, it, exactly, exactly that. And uh, yeah, me, me, myself, I, I honestly can't wait to be back. And uh, I, you know, to talk about it so often with people. And uh, yeah, it, it, it just, it just, make, it makes you quite, quite sad, really, to just think, you know, how great that is, and and how how it's been taken away. But yeah, I, I can't wait to be back. Um, but 
Mark, Marcus, well, one question I wanted to ask you. So when you were younger and also a younger player, did you ever sort of look at Sunderland and, and think, you know, in, in the future or something, that's, that's a club I, I quite like and I'd like to go and play for one day? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, no I, I, like I said, I didn't have any big teams to watch. I watched. I, I, I was just a local fan playing local football. So, no, as you get older, you realise what teams are big, what teams got the biggest crowds, what teams are doing well. You kind of get a bit more into it. But um, no, I mean, I, I've always, I've always I, I, as time moved on, I realised what a big club Sunderland is. I see big clubs. I, when I say big clubs, you know, I try and break that down. I think big clubs, with, with, they have big attendances. That's how I see a big club. So if you go on attendances, that's what some of them are. They're a big club. Um, probably their success doesn't um, match in with the attendances that they get, um, which is strange. The same with Newcastle, the same, same with your Birmingham, the same with your West Brom. You know, it's strange um, because, you know, you look at the likes of Burnley, they're successful, they've been in the Premier League for so long. So, by still class fans with big attendances, uh, sorry, teams with big attendances, clubs with big attendances, as big clubs, and some of them are up there with, with, the, with the biggest fan base, you know, in the Premier League. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, I think at Sunderland at full strength, you know, you, you you see what the fans are capable of, um, you know, even two seasons ago, going to the Checker Trade Trophy final <clears throat> and then taking 20, 30,000 fans down to Jafaga Square the night before. And, and that's a club in uh, in League One. You think, imagine if we were doing well in the Premier League, what, what it would be like then, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, you can, I don't remember Peter Reed day just before I joined. You know, the season before that, when they were flying and finished just below, I think it was eighth, wasn't it? They finished or seventh. Um, yeah. And they were, you know, they were, they were just rocking. Um, and the stadium, you know, watching matches a day or watching them on Sky, you remember that on the switch. And you could just tell, you know, you keep the fans quiet, going to that case, you've got a chance because they are such a, um, such a positive for the players on the pitch when things are going well. Yeah, a- a- absolutely. And we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll come on to Sunderland now. So time at Ipswich w- was was excellent, and then unfortunately you did have that did have that bad season where you know you got you got relegated um, with, with Ipswich. So do you think the sort of the time there was was right to to move on from Ipswich and 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 go to Sunderland? And how did that move come about? Yes, it was. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's one of those things that happens as a footballer. It happens not a lot, but it does happen. Um, you know, we got relegated, we were in the championship, some of them stayed up. Uh, I think it was the last day in the transfer window in August, I think. Um, uh, and I drove up to Sutton. Um, George probably got me into the office and said, you know, Sunderland are ready to take you. So I wanted to go back into the Premier League again, you know, and, and help help us stay up. Uh, as it was, and not help us stay up. <laughs> because we did actually get relegated that season as well. But I wanted to go and make a difference there. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a new challenge. You know, when you've been at a club for three years and you've been successful, um, generally you can smell success or, or, or failure and um, it wasn't wasn't going to go well. Which, so I decided to move on. Um, the club, I didn't instigate the move. I, I never have instigated the move from, away from a club when I was a player. So... Uh, it was time to go, George. Give me a call, and it was yeah, it was time. I just knew. You just know. I have, uh, you don't know until you look back, like I probably do now, really, and reflect on it. And it was the right thing to do going back. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, you came to Sunderland. Peter Reid was the, the manager that mm. that signed you. And we sort of, you know, you're thinking, well, you know, Sunderland have had these seasons of finishing, you know, seventh in the in the Premier League, and you know, got Quinn and Phillips there. Peter, Peter you know, Peter Reid signs you. What are your sort of expectations of of, of joining Sunderland, and how you think it's going to go? Um, I'm, I'm expecting to play in the Premier League again, play for a big club again, alongside Ipswich, as big as Ipswich. Um, that's um, that's what I'm expecting, and a new manager as well, some big name players at the club, as we all know at the time. So it was a, it was a, it was a, I think it was a step up because it put her in the championship and suddenly we're still in the Premier League. I saw it as a step up um, to kind of do well in the Premier League again, like I did the season before. So um, that's, how, that's how I looked at it. It was a total new challenge, a new move, you know, another 300 miles away. But 
I was used to traveling around anyway, so that that wasn't a problem. I just saw the club being a big club and uh, an opportunity to play in the Premier League again. And I've heard some good things about Peter Reid, so it was, it was it would be nice to work under him. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the season started off, and it, it didn't it didn't go too well with Peter Reid losing his job in the uh, in in the September. And um, when Peter Reid got got sacked, you know, Nar, Nar Quinn retired, um, and then and then you see that. Howard Wilkinson is going to come into the club. So, what, what was your reaction when you saw you saw that the news of Howard Wilkinson was going to come in and, and become Sunderland manager? Um, as a player, you kind of you very rarely stay at one club and stay with the same manager the whole time. Um, uh, so, in football, you know, when a manager gets sacked, there's always rumours flying around who's going to be next. Uh, and I didn't when Howard got. Uh, appointed as manager, I didn't know anything about him, so it was just a new new start. You know, your mind's kind of all over the place because you're wondering where he fit into his plans. Um, as it happened, I didn't fit very well into his plans, um, but still, it's you, you, these things can happen. Um, so it was a new start, really, in a clean slate, as they all say. Some mean it, some don't, and I mean managers saying that. Uh, so. Yeah, I, I, I didn't think nothing. I didn't. It was just part of the process of being a professional footballer at a football club. Um, just in time went on, and, and yeah, what happened? What happened after that? Uh, yeah, well, it was a positive time for me. That's for sure. Yeah, a lot of people, um, you know, the, sort of you know, Matt Piper, Kevin Phillips, have told story, interesting stories about uh, Howard Howard Wilkinson. How was he actually as a person? What was his training sessions like, and what was he like as a character? Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything too bad about Howard. Howard, Howard was Howard. Um, we did not see eye to actually, you know, one one time we didn't see eye to eye, but um, which happens with managers. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to berate his sessions or how he was. He was a manager. He had success in Division One. Um, I'll just say it didn't go how we both wanted it to go. That's all I'm going to say about it. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. And and then sort of he he, he loses his job as well, um, which was quite unfortunate, really, because it's very rare you see a manager appoint in a season and sack the, the same season as well. Mick McCarthy came in, um, and then you know was was given a task of trying to keep Sunderland up with, with his sort of last nine games. What are your sort of initial impressions of of Mick McCarthy? Same again, it's about a new manager coming in again, uh, third in the season, third in a matter of months, actually, not one season. Uh, and you're just waiting to find out what he thinks about you, really. You kind of get a feel for things. Um, his bad management was great. And I realised after two, three, four weeks that Mick was a good bloke and I liked him a lot. Um, and thankfully, he liked the way I played and liked what I was going to do. So, yeah. Um, he showed me a bit of respect and off the back of that he showed someone some loyalty he gave him some back and um, and it went pretty well under Mick um, probably one of the best managers I've worked under if I'm honest him and, him and George I'd say George Brown. yeah yeah, yeah, absolutely, and I mean the the, se the season after, um, you know, in in the championship, um, you know, two two semi finals as well, um, you know, that Millwall at Old Trafford. So, what what are your memories of uh, of that of that day? Um, I remember be before that day when the, the draw was made. We were all in the the, the meeting room um, at, at the Academy of Light. Uh, wait, watching the draw. You know, I don't, I don't remember who's in the other the other. Th the other two get the, the other semi final was, but I know we got drawn Millwall. And we thought, no disrespect to Millwall, but we had a good chance because you know they they, they were in our league and it was a great chance of getting into the final. Uh, Old Trafford, I think I was sub, came on the last 15 20 minutes, um, and I think we were 1 0 down at the time anyway. And you end up winning the game 1 0, which is quite quite devastating, really, because you know you don't really get many chances to play in the semi final, but to also play in the FA Cup final. Um, those moments don't come very often um, from for championship clubs to be in, to, to be in the semi final. So uh, for for us to lose that game wasn't a nice feeling because, like I say, it doesn't happen very often uh, unless you're a Man United, Arsenal, Man City. Those sort of games come around every year, every other year, whether it's the Champions League or Carabao Cup. But for someone in the championship, it didn't happen. So yeah, that that wasn't a nice feeling in football, and those those sorts of feelings. 
come around now and again, just like commotions come around now and again, you've got to try and deal with them and hope that they could come around again. Um, but no, that was a nice day. Yeah, no, my, my, my dad talks about it. Um, yeah, he was there. He just remembers us being all over Millwall all game. And uh, it was, it's just, it was devastating, how, you know, how we didn't, how we didn't win that. But, um, but, but yeah, you know, things like that happen in football. And I mean, it just would make you just appreciate the the good times a lot more, really, after that sort of devastating um, result at the end of the game. Yeah, it does. Um, it's a final. You miss out. I've never got to an FA Cup final. I've never got to a Carabao Cup final. Miss lost in both semi-finals. We lost in one for it, which um, I don't remember what it was called back then. A Carabao Cup final, whatever it is, whoever the sponsor was. Yeah. So, no, those sorts of things do play on your mind. But then you got to look at the positive things that went on in your career and that's what I try to do. I'm pretty good at um, forgetting bad things that happened to me. So, yeah, that's probably why I don't remember loads about the game to know it's Old Trafford. And yeah. Tim Kay got the winner. Yeah, Tim Kay. And that, to be honest, that was the start of his um, his incredible scoring streak against Sunderland because it, it seemed like every time he played against Sunderland, he scored, you know, for Everton um, a lot. But, uh, but yeah, that's disappointing. But the season after was a lot better because we, we actually, you know, won the league Won the league that season, um, you know, went back up to to the um, to the to the Premier League, and um, and yeah, to, I'm sure that was that was a great season that you were part of. Oh yeah, I'm excited. Towards the end of it, I kind of thought it was time to move away again at the time. Um, so yeah, to leave on a good note, win win the championship um, mm. with that group of players, which you'll see in a minute, um, was a nice feeling. You know, we, we had we had we had some good lads there, new lads. They weren't the Kevin Phillips that were before. They weren't the Kevin Kilbans. Um, they weren't the Nile Queens. Um, so no, it was a new group of players, really young lads with some seasoned pros from his round, in around the championship that have done right. So uh, Mick, like normal, got got the mix right, uh, got the team spirit right, and everyone was on the same wavelength. So that was a great season. Yeah, it was a nice one to finish on. I know that obviously in that summer. Yeah, of course, and and you know, I think I think a lot of Sunderland fans that they really did, um, you know, not to make you feel bad or anything, but I think a lot of them really did miss you, um, because the, you know I don't think they ever ever replaced you, and I think we we set a new record uh, points load total um, at at the club the, the following season. But did you? I, I've got a question, really. Did you ever like look back at, at Sunderland and think that's a struggling team there? You know, I, I could have got into that team, or, or were you glad that you did move away because it's Bristol City you went to, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I mean, the opportunity came up to go to the club that I've always I, I, I supported as a kid, so um, I didn't want to turn that down. As that happens, it didn't work out either. Um, but still, it was nice to to be to, to have been able to do that um, because I don't think if I didn't do that, I don't think I would have been able to live with myself. So um, I'm mm-hmm. glad I did. I'm disappointed it didn't work out how it did, but um, you know, you can't always predict these things are going to happen. And it did, but um, I don't regret going there. It's an, it was a it, it was something I wanted to do in my career. Yeah, no, fair, fair enough. Um, and then just got one last question um, for you, for you, Marcus, before we go through um, your, your Sunderland eleven. It's a question I ask all the guests. So, in your own words, if it isn't a difficult enough question, um, what does Sunderland AFC mean to you? It means a lot. I mean, because the reason why because it's a positive part of my career. Um, mm. The first season probably wasn't uh, a lot of negatives out of it. Um, obviously, getting ready get from the Premier League, but the next two years were great. You know, almost success. We were kind of nearly men, but we, we were building on something. You know, we lost in the semi final, the playoffs, um, last minute, then penalties. Yeah. Um, uh, we lost it yeah, in the FA Cup semi final, but there was something being built there, and it was a nice thing around, around the club. And then obviously the year after, we we kind of learned from that. Those young guys got a little bit more experience, and we ended up winning something at the end of the year, a championship that that I've never won in my in my in my career. I've been promoted, but I've never won a championship until that time, and I didn't win one since. Um, I've been runner up um, and got promoted for League Two. So those sorts of memories were. were, were were priceless to me as a football player, um, and what I what I liked about the fans, they're ruthless. The fans are ruthless. You either, if things aren't going well, and you're not mentally strong at that club, you're going to have big trouble as a player, because mm-hmm. 
you know, they want to see passion, they want to see flair players, they want to see a Sunderland team, and they want to see you try and be successful. Um, if you do those sorts of things, if you do Julio Arcas that worked hard and um, were creative, the fans will love you for the rest of their lives, and, you know, you're going to be a cult hero. But that, it's that simple. So as good as they are to you, and as much as they can be behind you, they can be ruthless to your face. And you have to, as a professional footballer, you have to deal with that. And if you're a young lad coming through, if you can deal with those fans when things aren't going too well, you're going to do all right in your career because it will help you mentally in your later on career. If you're an older player coming into that sort of environment and you haven't seen that before, you're probably going to get through it anyway because you've seen fans turn on players, turn on clubs. You've seen it all before. So... They, they they were a great education for me in terms of how fans are and how fans probably should be because, you know, they, they, they expect success, success in, at their football club. Um, so um, you better expect success. And if you're going to make, make get, be successful there, you've got a chance of being successful anywhere. So, yeah, it, it was an honest club, an honest set of fans that I kind of enjoyed at the time, but probably did like getting berated. It's one, one game springs to mind true away I think it was um, and I played quite well but I think we were losing or drawing we, did, we weren't or we, we were losing one nil or it was nil nil and I got berated when I came off um, but those sort of things kind of you kind of brush under the carpet it's, it's the way it is you're not scoring goals as a striker you, you're, you're the one who's going to get um, the, the foremost of the, of the abuse so but that's how it is and other games um in the last game, I think it was when we got promoted, I think it was Leicester at home, I think, um, when we got promoted, not as champions, but we, we, we guaranteed promotion. Um, and they were brilliant, you know. So you've got to take a rough with the smooth with those with, 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 with the Sunderland fans because they're honest and they're going to show their emotions whether they like you or not. Uh, so that's how, that's how my, my time with Sunderland, that's how I think of it. It was a positive impact on me. Um but that's because I took it on board and, and I don't get easily offended. <laughs> yeah, yeah, excellent. Well, well, well said, Marcus. Yes, I'm sure a lot of Sunderland fans would uh, be delighted to hear that. So we'll look back at your further great memories at Sunderland by going through your all-time Sunderland eleven. Now, one thing you may ask me, Marcus, if, if you've ever made it in anyone's Sunderland eleven, the answer to that is yes, you have. Uh, oh, you made well. it in. Um, <laughs> you made it in uh, Nick Barnes. Nick Barnes is um, Sunderland eleven. You're up front with Jermaine Defoe, so I think that'd be a. I think that'd be a fantastic partnership. Well, that's great. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. Um, all right then. So we'll we'll, we'll start off. Who you got? Uh, who you got in goal? Uh, Mark Poon. Yeah. Um, I, it's, 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 it's purely because I like Poon. He was a big giant in goal. He he was he was part of the team that got us promoted to to the champion uh, to the Premier League that year. Um, gentle giant, honest guy. Brilliant physique on him, just massive. You know, he looked big, but he was a big lad. Uh, just a nice guy, and 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 very good, very good goalkeeper. He was a great shot stopper, um, and that's why you know he, he fitted into our team. Yeah, he also scored that uh, incredible header against uh, Derby as well. I think did, did you play in that game as well? I think I did actually. Yeah, I forgot all about that. Um, I think I did <laughs> play that game. Yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah. You did. Yeah, do, 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 you not, do you not remember him him um, him going up for that uh, for that? I don't corner? know. I don't, but I, I probably do now. I, yeah, I have to look on that one. If I yeah, to I, I don't remember it massively. Yeah, but it, it was it was a fantastic header though. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, there's some more attributes. Yeah, you got you got in your team there. But Mark Poom, yeah, as you said, fan, fantastic goalkeeper. I think you gone with a four four two, I believe. Haven't you? Yeah, purely because that was a team back then. Well, like that now, I don't know. But you've asked me to do the team that I, I remember play, playing with. Yeah. Um, and there'd probably be one or two surprises in there, but uh, I'd explain that reason why if you yeah. want to do it now or after. It's up to you. Yeah, no, no. We'll just, we'll just, we'll just go through them. Um, okay. So next, we'll just go. Uh, we'll go to who you got a right back. Stephen Wright, tenacious yeah. right back. Never good bad. Who I really liked. Um. Got forward, good defender. You know that team that, that I'm going to go through. We're all kind of um, tenacious, hardworking. Um, obviously, lots of quality in the team. 
He's a great passer of the ball as well. Um, fitted in with team spirit. Um, and fitted in with the culture that Nick was trying to trying to create. I'm um, saying so Stephen Wright. Yeah, no, f- fair enough. Yeah, excellent. So we'll move over now to um, you do, who you have at left back. So who have you got there? George McCartney. Yeah. Tough, uncompromising left back. You know, George was always very serious. I, no, actually, no, he had a laugh, but when he got on the football pitch, he was a serious footballer. Um, mm. With great legs, get up and down the pitch. Great 1v1, really good defender, could put a cross in. A leader as well, I'd say. Yeah. Um, so, no, and, you know, he, he fitted in with the group he lost as well. There was... There's other people I can I can I'm gonna go into in a moment, but they all all the players fit into that ethos. So yeah, a natural left footer as well, so it gave us a bit of balance on that left side. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, t- two spells at Sunderland uh, as well, along with two spells at West Ham. Um, but yeah, no, the f- fantastic left back there. One I remember quite well as well. He was a, a fantastic player. Um, all right, then. So we'll, we'll we'll switch now to your we'll go to your centre centre half. So do you want to talk us through each one of them? Uh, Stephen Caldwell, of course. Um, another tough centre half Scottish um, who had a great partnership with Guy Breen uh, in that year so um, so no Steve Caldwell good on the ball you know talked a good game could hear his voice bellowing across the pitch talking all the time um, and, and that's what he was he was and he was a, another good lad so it fits into kind of rhythm here. I think it's important that I like people that fit into the ethos, and Steve Steve was one of those. So, yeah, him, 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 he was definitely another one. Yeah, no, f- yeah, fantastic. And then his defensive partner? This guy, Ring. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, experienced, they both had experience, but experienced, international, um, I think it's funny, I think, uh, I think it was Gary Breen's first ever promotion as a player. Um, mm. We spoke about it after, and he was telling me he'd never been promoted for until that until that day. I don't know how old he was then. He would have been late twenties, I would have thought, early thirties, uh, similar to me. But that was his first ever game. But you know, quick, quick he was. They were both good on the ball. Him, him and Stephen, um, and a good captain around the pitch. Good lad around the training training ground as well. Um, quite quiet around the training ground at times, but when it comes to training. And playing games, he was another serious footballer. Yeah, yeah, no, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very solid um, goalkeeper and, and back four you got there. Um, so, right, brilliant. We'll move on to who you have in the midfield. So, we'll start with who you have on the left wing first. <laughs> who else? Julio. Julio was great. Yeah. Julio Marker. I mean, you know, he was probably one of the only superstars that had stayed from the previous, just the first season I was there. Uh, fans loved him. Um, you know, like I said, we've got a bit of a solid back four, but Julio could could open up anything, open up, open up a can of beans with his left foot. And another guy I liked, you know, he, he was yeah. great around the chain room, having a laugh, always smiling, uh, and worked hard for the team as well. He wasn't, he, you know, you normally associate flair players with just being flair and someone else do the hard work for them, uh, but Julio wasn't like that. He, he, he would put his hard work in and he would, and he would try and create something as well. Um, so who yeah, yeah. I think a lot of fans as well. They they can see how much he cares because you know players come from Argentina and then he he played pretty much nearly all of his English football career in the northeast. You know he stayed. You know went to Sunderland, Middlesbrough afterwards, and then finished at South Shields. So as someone who did also buy into the area as well, being a foreign player. Yeah, yeah, I still there now, isn't he? Yeah, well, he, I think he, I think he, he's gone back to Argentina now, but he played for it. He played for a little um, sort of well, a non-league side, yeah, South South Shields. Um, so he, he just, he just stayed in North. He's got a fantastic uh, Argentinian with a northeast twang accent now, um, <laughs> which is yeah, fan, fan, yeah, yeah, brilliant from Julio. So I think a lot of fans have put him in his team, uh, in their team, because they they all love him. But yeah, no, fair enough. Yeah, Julio Arca gets his works way into your team. So we're going out to he have on the. Um, the right wing. Oh, Liam Lawrence. Um, yeah. Liam came in, I think it was the, I think it was this, the, the season we got into the playoff final. So the season after Peter Reid, well, the first season that Mick took over properly, I know he, he was coming for the last seven, eight games, but Liam Lawrence came in after that, I think it's from Mansfield. Um, so no one really knew a lot about him. 
you know another young another younger player coming coming up to play at another a higher level. Uh, and he fitted in great as well, and um, you know went on to have a brilliant career in the Premier League and internationally. Um, so no, Liam was another one that right footed player, not low pace, not wasn't slow, but he wasn't lightning quick like he would associate with winners back then. But he had a brilliant right foot, and he had a massive engine on him. He could run all day. He was one of the fittest lads I played with in terms of engine wise. Um, so, you know, and he could see a pass as well. He's a bit different than Julio. Julio is more, um, could dribble more around his feet and around some, whereas Liam used to be a bit like, I remind, it reminded me of a, a David Beckham in a way, how he, can, how he could curl a ball and how he passes a ball. Um, mm. So, uh, Liam, Liam had different qualities to Julio, but they were creative qualities, which I kind of liked. And then yeah. around, around, around the dressing room. Yeah, exactly. That's that's very important as well. Um, yeah, I, I think he unfortunately did fall out with um, with, with Roy Keane um, when, when Roy Keane came to the club, um, uh, and then he, he went on and played quite well for Stoke City. Um, but yeah, no, no, Liam Norris, a fantastic choice uh, in I your mean, team there. One 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 moment that sticks out from my mind was Wigan away towards the end of that season where we were made champions, mm. and he it was his assist for my goal. Um, I don't think another player would have seen that ball, um, but a bit yeah. of eye contact, and he just put it in behind the back four. Just the weight of the ball and um, the kind of technique he used to get the ball in behind the back, in behind the defenders was, I don't think any, any other player on that pitch for us could have done that. So that was the type of thing Liam could do. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I think you know it, it's it's a quality not a lot of um, you know not all players have, and that's, it's fantastic um, to to see that. You know, it's been very rare we've had players like that. You know, go back a you know maybe Summerby. You know, we've had players like that maybe more in recent times. Maybe Stefan Sessegnon. Or, but yeah, no Liam Lawrence, a fantastic choice um, you got there as well. So we're going out to your your central your central midfield. Do you want to talk us through who you've got there? I was a bit stuck. I was a bit tough one actually because. We had Jeff Whitley, uh, Dean Whitehead, and Carl Robinson, really. Mm. And sometimes Dean played out on the right uh, instead, of, instead of Liam. Um, and Carl was playing more often than not alongside Jeff um, because Dean had come from a lower league club as well that season. So I don't remember where it was from. So it's a tough one. So I, to leave Carl out was tough because he was, a cap- he was our captain as well um, at times. Uh, but the reason I went with Dean and Jeff was because Jeff was tenacious and would just get around the pitch and rough people up, um, play it simple, knew his game. Dean had a bit more legs than Jeff, was more of a box-to-box player and would get you a goal from somewhere. So, um, whereas Carl was more of sitting in front of the back four, shielding the ball into people with great passer on the ball and organised things. So, yeah, I know I've gone with them too, but I could have put between the three of them, I would have probably moved them around a bit, but I've gone with the one who's tenacious with one with with legs that gets up and down the pitch. Um, and Dean was, Dean is still is now, was a, an honest player as well, who was really fit uh, and fitted in with, with the group, although he was a new player for those two years at Mick. Was 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 with us uh, with me in a way. Sorry that I was there for. A bit in great, quiet, um, family man, but you know, had, had fitting in with with Nick Foss, You know, so Nick scouting that year, did the previous year and that year, um, when all, all, most of the players left. You know, the gang, um, the Phil Babs and all those left and Kevs and. Um, and players like that, he had to replace them and he replaced them with young players that were hungry and would fit into the team. And Dean was one of those that, that he got spot on again. You know, uh, not many of those players and Mick Braun didn't go on after that and to have really good careers. And he was yeah. one of them. And Jeff obviously was experienced head he, who Mick would have known, um, obviously playing against, playing with and managing against, managing with. So Jeff, Jeff was another lad that fitted into the group as well. So a, a bit different to Dean. He was a player that had been around a bit, and not a player coming through the rank, not a, sorry, a player that was coming up from the lower leagues. Jeff, Jeff was Jeff. And we knew what he brings to the table. 
which was honesty, hard work, um, and great for team spirit. Yeah, exactly that. And um, I think you know when um, you know I, I said to my dad, uh, you know, you chose, you just showing him your team, and he says, uh, "Jeff Whitley." And he goes, "Oh, Jeff Whitley." Uh, and he, he just remembered the, um, the the playoff semi final um, in the penalty shootout. Um, yeah. his, pen, his penalty that he took. Um, it's, it's unfortunate, really, because I think it's so. It, it, same thing sort of happened with, with Mickey Gray in the um, in the the playoff final against against um, Charlton. But you know, you, you you take a penalty and you miss it, and what that does for your confidence and maybe your reputation. I think that's quite unfair in in many ways. Would you agree? Uh, it is. I mean, you know, Mick never, uh, Mick never really recovered from that. He, you know, the fans, you know, from that, which I was surprised with because he was a son of a lad. Mm. Um, but the difference with Jeff is he had the year after to recover from that. We got we were made champions, so um, he got a bit of redemption, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. And that's unfortunate. But, you know, th- things like that happen. Um, I, was but, yeah, no. I, was, I think I came off sub, I think, just before... Um, yeah. Uh, time. So I would have probably been on there and taken a penny. I'm glad it wasn't me that missed it. And it was Jeff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, it's unfortunate. But as you say, it was, a, it was a good season afterwards. And even with the Mickey Gray penalty, you know, you have to say, yeah, he did miss the penalty. But, you know, the season after they went on and got a 105 point season and, and yeah. went up. So, you know, you, you sort of, you, you know, your lads did the, a very similar thing. So, yeah, fair enough. You got his way into your team. We'll move now to your, your two strikers who you, who you got up front. Now, I'm very disappointed you didn't put yourself in the team. Yeah, I can't <laughs> but, uh, um, again, I was torn, but I was a bit like the um, uh, two uh, centre midfield players because it's Chris Brown, the young lad coming through, dogged by injuries, but the quality in him was there to see. For a big lad, he had the skills of Peter Crouch. He could move as well. He wasn't he wasn't just a big lad who just stand at the middle. You got to hit him with balls going forward. He could run down the sides. He was bright. Um, he he would have gone on to have a really decent career, you know, a longer career as well if it wasn't through his injuries. Um, and Stephen Elliott, who Nick got as well for me up for a young lad who went on to have a great career. So. Um, yeah, those you know those two. St- I think Stephen got sixteen goals that season. We got promoted, to, uh, got got made champions. And I think Chris got seven or eight. And it'd be interesting to see what his stats were in terms of how many games he played because I wouldn't have thought we would have played loads. Um, so to get seven or eight uh, that season, being injured as well, but um, they were two young lads as well coming through. So you had a mixture of young lads coming through. Lads that have played in lower leagues and a mixture of older players that have been around and done it, but um, everyone was out there to get promotion and, and do well for the team. Um, and that team had that mixture. You know, it wasn't a reason why I haven't picked the likes of Kevin Phillips, Nile Quinn, or those sorts of Claudia Rainers because that first season I was there was. A disastrous season so I'm not picking a team anyone that's in the team that's in, not not done very well so that's why I picked a team that was a positive team that got that club promoted um, everyone would normally you know most people probably pick them players you know but I'm not because like I said we got relegated that season so um, I'd like to positive, uh, focus on the positive team that got the club back to where it belongs really um, and that, those guys were part of that along with um, Neil Collins Along with Kyle, uh, Kevin Kyle, um, so yeah, th- that was the team. Um, yeah, done, done Mick Pro. Yeah, absolutely fantastic, uh, fantastic. Yeah, I think St- Stephen Elliott, yeah, he scored a fantastic goal um, against, against Newcastle. I think which a lot of Sunderland fans uh, rem- remember very well. Um, but also, I wanted to ask you, about, obviously, as a striker. Now you, you see it very often in in football. Now, what's your sort of relationship like with other strikers? You know, when you're on the training pitch, because you are sort of in competition with them at the same time. Because you, you know, you are fighting for that place in in the starting uh, eleven. So, how's that sort of relationship with the other strikers? Yeah, it's good. I, I, the, the, the only thing that that I would, I'm I'm fine with other people, other players, other other players that are in my position. But if you've got a bit of arrogance about you on the pitch and a bit of you know, and you're a bit standoffish, then my relationship won't be good with you. Um, hmm. So and care you are, um, but there wasn't many strikers I came across that weren't there to help me or or. or 
I disliked. Um, Chris, Chris was a young lad coming through I liked. Stephen was a young lad coming through I liked. Um, Kev Carr was as well. So, I, I, yeah, uh, it, it doesn't bother me. As long as we're all trying to help each other um, on the training pitch and within the team ethos, no problem with anyone. Um, so that never really happened in my career. It might have happened to other players, but very, very good strikers. I was, I was, I'd like to, I'd like to help them players if I liked you. If I liked you, if I didn't like you, then I wouldn't. Yeah, no, that, that's that's fair enough. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Go on, go on. Say, say that again. Sorry, just 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 uh, broke up. I like some people as people, uh, players as people as well as I did as players. Um, you know, and all those players on that team there I liked. So um, that's why I've chosen along 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 with the fact that there was a great team spirit and we got promoted. That's why I've chosen. Yeah, no, f- fair, fair enough. I'm sure, I'm sure that'd be a fantastic team um, to get promoted there. Now, obviously, that's your team going along the bottom of the screen. Everyone, everyone can see. Now, with with a team, you always need a manager. So, do you want to tell us? I mean, I mean, you said his name plenty of times, but do, we'll, we'll talk about him anyway. Who have you gone with? I uh, Mick, Mick McCarthy. Of course, you know he was. Yeah. You know, from being Peter Reid bringing him in, not really getting a chance to show him what I could do. He wasn't there long enough. Um, that, but I like I like I like uh, Peter. Um, from Howard Wilkinson, um, that's enough said about Howard. And then to Mick, who, yeah. who who's who's seen the positives in me really and maybe put my mind at rest on me straight away. So uh, yeah, uh, and that and that was why and he was the manager that got promoted. So it's all about being positive. So. The team's a positive team that got the club promoted and manager was Mick at that time. So I'm not going to choose anyone else anyway because um, he got that group of players together, young, old, experienced, um, and got it spot on for that season. So, yeah, good on him. Yeah, no, no, yeah, exactly. Yeah, good on him. And, um, yeah, no, that's fantastic. So we, we got your team there. We've got your manager. All I have to say, really, is thank you very much uh, for Marcus Shook coming on. Uh, how, how have you found it, Marcus, talking through the team? Yeah, great. You've been great, Matt, to be honest with you. I've done one or two podcasts and you've been probably one of the best ones. Well done. Good work. <laughs> But yeah, th- thank you very much. Um, but, but yeah, one, one question I always ask all the guests um, just before just before we finish: Do you have a message for the Sunderland supporters watching? Um, yes, I think I, I think you. Uh, I've seen Lee Johnson do um, about Bristol City. I think he's a bold manager um, uh, and wants to do a play attacking football. Has some good ideas, and I'm glad to see that he started off very well. They're not going to be there for the cup final, but um, the fans especially. But hopefully, that's that cup final will be uh, a hoodoo that will finish Sunderland's hoodoo at Wembley in recent years. So, um, off the back of that, playoffs or maybe automatic motion could happen. So, um, I think you've got a good, young, bold manager at, at your club, and I think you, you you will see a different a different type of Sunderland playing, uh, more attacking. That's for sure. So. When things don't go too right for him, stick with him because you you get it right again. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, we, all, we, we all hope you're uh, you're right there, Marcus. Um, but yeah, no, when I when I did say to Sunderland fans, I was going to be speaking to you. You know that all they had to say was, "Is what a fantastic player you know he was." So if we all had a message for you, Marcus, all, all it is, is is thank you very much for everything you did did at Sunderland Football Club, and uh, yeah, you, you knew what it meant to play, and uh, yeah, we're, we're all very. We're all very happy, and uh, yeah, thank thank you for everything you did as well. So that's that's uh, one thing from us as well. Um, thank you, Matthew. Yeah, no problem. Stay safe as well. Uh, go check out Food Bank and the Fans Museum. Links are in the description below. But yeah, from me and Marcus. Uh, we'll see you all in the next episode. How are the lads?